Well, good morning, everybody. Let's find out who our dads are. If you are a dad, would you please stand? And we want to acknowledge you guys. Let's give it up for the dads. All right. So dads, keep standing. No, no, yeah, keep standing. We're going to stand the rest of the service. (laughs) If you're just a man but not a dad, would you please stand? All right, yeah, let's call it high school and up. High school and up. If you're high school and up, guys, please stand. All right, let's give it up for the men. All right, dads and men, this is your lucky day because I'm speaking to you today. This sermon is for you. Every minute, every second, every point, this message is for you. I hope you're ready to hear from God, not from me, but hopefully from God. Let's all stand and let's read Genesis 2, 15 to 17, which says this. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Dads, men, you are crucial to our church, to our society, to our country. Moms are so important too. My mom was the spiritual leader in our home, and I wouldn't be here if it was not for my mom. But dads, you're important. Men, you're important. You may be seated. So my big idea is that we need men on point. We need men on point with God. We need men on point with their wives. We need men on point with their children. It begins by being a point man. And in Genesis 2, 15 to 17, we see that God took the first man we know as Adam and put him in the Garden of Eden And he gave him two commands. The first was, I want you to go to work. It it must have been the easiest uh, work in the garden ever because there were no weeds yet. It must have been fun to work in that garden. But he was to work in the Garden of Eden and to take care of it. He was to be a steward of God's creation. But then he said, I want you to obey me. I want you, he says, you're free. He, He gave man free will. And he was free to eat of every tree in the Garden of Eden. I don't know how many different trees that were in that garden. Maple, oak, whatever, maybe none of those were in there. But he gave them freedom to eat from every tree. Except, you know what, Adam, there's a tree in the middle. And I don't want you to eat from that. Now, he didn't tell him he couldn't touch it. But I would assume he probably said, don't eat from it. Now, maybe you can walk around it ten times, you can get close to it, you can sniff it, but you can't eat from that tree, because in the day you eat of that tree, you will what? Certainly die. How hard is it to just not do one thing? (laughs) How hard? I mean, it wasn't like he gave him a hundred things don't do. It's one negative command. Just don't do this one thing. And Adam had a, had a tough time doing that. God wants men who are fully devoted to him. Jesus picks this up in the book of Luke, chapter 14, 25 to 26, when he says this, Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turned to them. He said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, Such a person cannot be my disciple. Now listen, I picked out this verse for this sermon way before Pastor Omero picked it out last week, okay? So I don't know what he was doing. He didn't run it by me. But if you were last week, he went into all this. I'm just going to touch on it briefly because he stole my thunder and he's not coming back again. But anyway, um, (laughs) just kidding. We'll have him back, you know, one of these days. What does it mean to hate your father and mother? It's a Hebrew idiom. It means to love less. Obviously, we're not called to hate our father and mother. Children are called to obey and honor your father and mother. 
husbands are called to love their wives. It just means to love less. It means that if, uh, if your wife's number one, you need to demote her a little bit. Because God has to be number one. And she and your siblings and your kids fall in line after that. Men, if you feel like you need more money, and many of you may feel like you need more money, there's nothing wrong with having more money, but if that means you get an opportunity to move halfway across the country to take a new job, to earn uh, a third or a half more money than you're making now, but that means you looked it up and in that town or whatever, wherever it is has no good Bible teaching church within driving distance and you're going to work 30 more hours a week, which means you're not going to be able to be with your family ever in church and you're never going to see your wife and your kids because you're working overtime, but you're going to bring them all this money? No. It's not obvious. Don't take that job. Put God first Love him above all. He'll find a way to provide for you. Men, God has called us to be on point. And God called Adam to be on point. Unfortunately, he failed. He failed. And I don't know what he was thinking. In Genesis 3, it says that Satan, through the serpent, tempted Eve. And, and Eve got a little confused and when she went to grab that, what, what kind of fruit do you think it was? A pear. I hate pears. Anyway, I never would have eaten it, okay? Let's say it was, I don't know, it wasn't an apple, but everybody says apple. He went to eat that apple. Adam should have been like, wait, Eve, no, 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 no. You, you may not have heard. In fact, I think the Bible says that God gave the command to Adam before Eve was even possibly created. Hey, if I didn't tell you before, I, gotta, I forgot to tell you, whatever you do, you can't eat from this tree. And when she grabbed it and went to put her mouth, he should have just, well, you don't want to knock your wife over, right? But it would have been better. He should have said, no, grab that and throw it out of the garden. Genesis 3 says he was with her. So he did not lead. And then after she ate, he said, well, oh, well, I guess I'll have some too. And the world's been a mess ever since, right? First thing he did was he ran. They hid. They now knew they were naked. And they felt shame and men have felt shame ever since. Men and women have felt shame ever since. We're wearing masks because Adam messed up. Dads, you are to be a leader. Lead your family, and your decisions will have a ripple effect on your children, your grandchildren. And you've got to think 100 years down the line, your leadership will affect your great-grandchildren. You've got to keep that in mind. If you're 16 years old in this room, 15, 14, 15, 16, you're going to be 18 soon. Then you're going to be 21 before you know it. And you're going to be 22, you're going to be out of college. Don't go off point. Don't fall asleep at 16 years old. If you believe and if you... Go to a secular public school. I want to challenge you to be a point man at Lincoln or Urbana at Walkersville. Don't go to Walkersville. Whatever it is, be <laughs> sort of Pastor Steve is. Anyway, you got to be a point young man, and you're going to get made fun of. You're going to get made fun of. It's okay. Three practical commitments. First, Men, have a daily devotion. Now, I don't want to be legalistic about this for seven days a week. If it means you have a devotion five days a week, great. Find 15 minutes every day to be in your Bible, to be in prayer. Start with the book of John, read chapter one today, chapter two tomorrow, chapter three. You know, figure it out. Talk to me. Get a Bible in one of your plan. However you want to view it, just try to get some time alone with God. Just you and him, okay? Every day. Second, a weekly worship. I know that you can't be in church every week. You know, we got people on vacation right now. Vacations are good, unless they're all, all year long, okay? <laughs> Vacations are good. But to the best of your ability, 
commit to a weekly worship. And then third, commit to a bi-weekly group if you can. Any kind of small group, men's group, ladies group, couples group, care group, support group, you name it. Find a group that you can be a part of because you can't do this alone. So point men, that's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to be on point and put the Lord center in your life and make him the most important thing. Once we're point men, now when we get married, we can be point husbands, okay? So that's the second point. Be a point husband. Genesis 2, 20, 21 to 24 says this. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Be a point husband. Now, one thing we see about in this passage is that marriage is made in heaven. So the Lord God caused the man. Now, ladies, if your husband's always sleeping, I'm sorry. Maybe God caused it once in a while. But the Lord God caused the man to fall into a, a deep sleep. He's in the rapid eye movements right now, right? He is in a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, God took one of his ribs and closed up the place. Guys, if you want to marry a woman of God, it's going to hurt. God's going to have to hurt you. Somewhere along the way, it's going to hurt. Some girl is going to crush your heart. Um, it never happened to me. But anyway, some girl's just kidding. It has. You're going to have to go through a little pain, okay? But that's okay. He just, at least he was asleep, right? He yanked that. I wonder how long it took God to yank that rib out of there. Yanked that rib out of there, then smoothed it over. Fashioned out of this rib a woman. And brought her to the man. God, he, guys, he can bring her to you. He can bring her to you. Um, he can do that many ways, but he can bring her to you. So my story, as some of you know, was when I was uh, back in the day, um, uh, had my heart broken, you know, I don't, guys, don't even, just forget about girls. If you're young, just forget about them, okay? Had my heart broken. And when I'm going for a walk, I'm on Broad Street in Philadelphia. I'm like, Lord, this year, I'm 24 years old, don't bring any girls into my life. I do not want to see them. I do not like them, okay? Don't bring any girls into my life this year because next year I'm moving to Dallas to go to seminary. I don't want to have to put up with all this mess. You guys ever done, said that kind of a prayer? Okay, is anybody awake here this morning? <laughs> Three hours later, on my doorbell, beep, the doorbell rings. And there's my future wife smiling. I'm like, Lord, why did you do this to me? <laughs> but she was so pretty, right? You have to sometimes give up on the dream to get the dream. You just got to give, put in God's hands. He can bring her to you. You don't have to make it happen because if you had to make it happen, how do you know it was of God? If you had to twist her arm to get her to say, okay, no, God can do it, right? What are some ways God, how does God arrange marriages? Well, I can think of three. eHarmony, <laughs> Christian Mingle, and Match.com. Anyway, just joking. There's another way. It's called the Knee Bone Daughters, Okay. I've got three available daughters left, okay? <laughs> three down, three to go. Guys, if you're interested, call me. Just remember that if I let you, I give my daughter to you, I own you for the rest of your life. I see Brent in the back. He's going to do some work for me today. He doesn't even know it yet, but he's going to put a new light bulb in my car. And anyway, uh, I own you for the rest of your life, okay? If, but you better, you know... Be worthy. You better be worthy. Marriage is made in heaven. And the first duty of the husband here 
in verse 24, that is why a man, what's it say? Leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Men, men, you want to marry her, you better be ready to leave your mom. Now, I'm not saying you're not nice to her. You've got to be ready to leave home. If you aren't ready to leave home, you are not ready to get married. You can still see your parents and love your parents. Just don't live off your parents, okay? You've got to have this emotional transition to where your wife is number one and your mom is number two. That makes sense? If your mom's still number one, your marriage is going to be in a tr world of hurt, okay? By the way, this is a free seminar right now. You don't have to pay me for this, okay? I mean, people spend all this money. This is free today, okay? I want you to know that. Second duty of the, of the husband is to love. Let's go to Ephesians 5, 25 to 31. Ephesians 5, 25 to 31. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. And now they're quoting Genesis 22, 24 again. For this reason, man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Verse 25, husbands love your wives. So this is a sacrificial love. The Greek word here isn't eros. It's not a romantic love, although you, you want to have that. You ought to have that. But this is a sacrificial love, husbands, for your wives. Now, if you've been in Christian churches long enough, you've heard that wives are to submit to their husbands and all that kind of good stuff. But remember, the husband is to love his wife. Let me get to that in a minute. I got a slide for you. We're going to take a trip down memory lane. There we go. Oh, isn't that nice? So we celebrated our 33rd anniversary last week, June 7th. That's 1986. That's me on the right, by the way. <laughs> That's Lori in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She is, um, you know, exchanging our rings at that time, saying a few sweet words. Then we've got us. That's probably the most important picture, right? You know, praying. I don't know what point in the service that was. If it was the end or right after the pastor's message. Um, and then the wedding reception, you know, the two now um, together married, and that was, uh, I still look just like that, don't I? Anyway, just kidding. Um, so that's 33 years ago. 33 years is a long time. You know, I was 25 then. I, I've been 33 years. If you do the math, I'm now 38. So that's how it works, right? 33 years is a long time. And so... If anyone here is thinking about getting married anytime soon, you need to know 33 years from now, uh, there's going to be a few bumps along the way. All right? So we've buried both of our dads, as well as other family members. Um, she, not I, she has given birth to seven children. So there's a little pain involved there. Um, but a joy at the end, right? most of the time. Um, <laughs> six high school graduations, four, five college graduations, um, millions of miles on our car. You know, when you, this area, you got to drive 20 miles to get anywhere. Driving everywhere. You know, kids don't understand you sign up for a sport. It means your kid, your parents are going to debt. That hundred dollars turns into a million dollars, all the mileage. And Countless trips to the doctor, countless trips to the doctor, um, three weddings, okay, three weddings, now three grandchildren, with grandchildren are great, because most of the time they don't sleep at my house, three grandchildren, 
and one or two arguments along the way. Just one or two arguments along the way. And when we had those one or two arguments, um, I'm proud to say it was not my, I mean, I'm proud to say it was not her fault, right? It wasn't her fault. You know, one time we got into a, a big fight. No, I got to clarify because this culture, this world's so messed up. An argument, you know, not a fight. You know what I'm saying? Not a physical fight, but a couples, you ever get into a fight? No. Never. <laughs> okay, that's right. We can have confession afterwards. Um, you come see me in my room. We can get the wall there and we can, you know. We had this big fight. I didn't remember when it was. I think we were living in Iowa at the time. We had this big fight. And uh, somewhere along the way, I think we're 10 minutes into it. I don't know how long we're into the fight. Uh, either she said it or I said it. We're like, you know what? The devil is the enemy. You're not the enemy. So I realized she's not the enemy. She realized I'm not the enemy. So the devil is the enemy. He's trying to put a wedge between us. He wants me to be unforgiven, her to be unforgiven, me to be upset, her to be upset, and now it to get, you know, really angry, you know? Some people just can't control their anger. And, and then you don't talk. He, the devil wants to, okay, the devil wants to ruin your marriage. And when you leave, he's wants to destroy your family. He wants to bring your family down. And men, he wants to ruin your legacy for the rest of your life. And when you remember Jesus said, pray that we not to be led into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The evil one will seek to devour you. You have to remember that. Keep a perspective. And you're on the same team, right? You're on the same team. As you go through your marriage as a point husband, if you are, and I believe you are called to be the leader, how does that work? So I'm going to give you some, just a practical piece of advice. J.D. Greer, a pastor, I listened to a podcast, and he said, if the, this is how it works, that he says the husband gets the tie-breaking vote. All right? Now remember... For most dumb men, they think the wife never even gets a vote. So she gets a vote, and he gets a vote, is that he gets the tie-breaking vote. So just hang in there with me, okay? Let me try to help. Let me explain. So for example, let's say you, you, you want to know where you're going to go out to eat. You want to go out on a date tomorrow night, right? She wants to go to the tasting room. He wants to go to the Black Hog. Tie-breaking vote. You go to the tasting room. Right? right? I may be dumb, but I'm not stupid, okay? <laughs> Where are you going to go on vacation? She wants to go to the beach. He wants to go to the mountains. Tie-breaking boat. You go to the beach. How are you going to decorate your house? She wants to paint the kitchen light blue. You want to paint the kitchen dark blue? You paint the kitchen light blue. Men, she always gets what she wants in the kitchen. All you get is the garage. That's a piece of advice. She gets the rest of the house. Christmas, she wants a real Christmas tree. You're getting old and you're tired of cutting down these real Christmas trees and paying all this money for a month. That's not a good investment. You're not being a good steward of God's money. You're like, I get an artificial for 200 or last bean for 30 years. You want an artificial tree? What's the tie-breaking vote? You get a real Christmas tree, right? To see how that works? How... What professional football team are your children going to root for? She wants them to root for the Dallas Cowboys. You want them to root for the New York Giants. The tie-breaking vote, they root for the New York Giants. <laughs> that, is, that is how it works. You know, if there's 100 decisions I'm going to yield on, I get that one decision. And if, that's, if I just get that, if somebody gives me a onesie of a Dallas Cowboys, no, you cannot do that in my family, all right? Men, where the most important thing you got to take on the most important thing when she's making the wrong decision, then you got to overrule her the rest of the time. Be a loving leader. Men are so dumb, they just don't understand that. And they are overbearing, exasperate their wives, controlling, 
Stop. You can't do that. Three practical commitments. First, a weekly walk, talk, and prayer with your spouse. Just go on a walk. It, it could be daily, but I'm just giving you what's got to be the minimum. A weekly walk, talk, and prayer. Second, a monthly date. All right? Do, do, can any of you men spell date? D-A-T-E. Okay? Uh, Monday. That's tomorrow, right? Yeah, I'm flying to Chicago tomorrow, okay? For three days. Tuesday, my wife's flying to South Africa for 10 days. So when I get back, she's not going to be here. So please, uh, food, money, whatever you want, send to me. Um, then I'm going to my mom's for four days. So like, there's going to be a period of time where we're not going to hardly see each other for two weeks. So tomorrow, we're going on a lunch date. Yeah, oh, isn't that nice? We're going on a lunch date. I don't know. New Market has Burger King. Mc, you know, no, I'm not doing that. No, we're not going to do that. Third, an annual weekend away. So you got to figure this out. Guys, if it's $300, whatever it is, you got to find two nights somewhere. You got, there's a conference called a weekend away you can go to, weekend to remember. Whatever it is, you're going to have to get away. And just you and her. Not you and her and the dogs and the cats, okay? You're going to have to figure it out. So you have to be a point man, then a point husband, and then last but not least, a point dad. Ephesians 6.4. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Be a point dad. So dads, okay, again, raise your hand if you're a dad. All right, okay, you got to memorize this verse. It's, I know it's longer than Jesus wept, okay? But you got to memorize it. You can put your hand down now. you got to memorize, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Do not exasperate your children. Do not be so overbearing. Do not be such that rules rule. Rules can never rule. There's always exceptions to rules. Even if the Sabbath, Jesus says there are exceptions to rules. When you frustrate your kid to the point, not where your son or daughter gets angry at one moment, but over a period of time, one, two years, whatever it is, you have oppressed or been so strong that you exasperate your child. Well, that's on you. So, we exasperate when our tough love exceeds our tender love. We exasperate when our tough love exceeds our tender love. We enable when our tender love exceeds our tough love. We don't want to exasperate. We don't want to enable. We want to bring them up instead in the nurture and instruction of the Lord. Some, one statistic says that when a child is the first convert in a family, the probability, percentages are that three and a half percent percentage that the rest of the family will come to Christ. When the mother, the wife, is the first convert in the family, 17% chance the rest of the family come to Christ. When the father is the first convert, it now goes up to 93%. So everyone's important, but dads, you are crucial to your family, your children, your grandchildren. Three practical commitments. A daily play and pray. Okay, you got to have fun with your kids, okay? Daily play and pray. Second, a weekly time in the Word. Give them a memory verse. Get a picture Bible when they're young. Something, every week if you can, spend some time in God's Word with them. That may vary when they're 17 years old. I understand how things change. It's a lot easier when they're seven. But try to figure it out. And then third, a... Occasional, a special milestone memory. So every few years, Dad, you're going to need to do something special to your kid. When they're 11 and 12, we have a program called Passport to Purity. Moms, take your daughters away for a weekend. We can provide that for you. It's a program that you talk about purity with your daughter. Dads, do that with your sons when they're 12. Passport to Purity. It could be any of a number of things. It could be before they graduate from high school, do something special, or after high school, do something special. Think of ways that you can do special things that are milestone events in their life 
at different times where they look back when they get older and say, that was, a, that was an important period of, in my life. One thing I've done, and I've shared this before, and uh, uh, when my kids got to fifth or sixth grade, I got them all a journal, and I write in their journal. They don't write in it. And so on Christmas Day, I write a letter to my kids. On their birthday, I write a letter to my kids. Um, and then, see, there's all these entries. This is Lisa's journal, actually. I write all these letters, and then um, the night before they get married, I write the last letter, and then they keep it. Well, they keep it, too, but I keep getting it back from them. But once they get married, they take it, because they've, remember, they've moved out of my house, and they keep it in their house with their husband. And I hope 50 years from now, it's my prayer, 50 years from now when I'm not around anymore, she's going to read every entry, and now it's just different, right? Because I want to leave that legacy with them. I've got a story I want to read for you. It's, take a, it's going to take about five minutes, and then we're going to close. So please bear with me, but I think it's worth it. I'm going to try to get through without my reading glasses, but I got them here just in case. It's from a book called Point Man by Steve Farrar. Men, we want you to be point men, point husbands, point dads. This was written 20 years ago. It's still a great book. So please give me about four minutes. Please listen if you can. He says this. It's 1966, and you are only 18. You're in the absolute prime of youth. You've got a driver's license, a girlfriend, and plenty of dreams. Your entire life is ahead of you. But through a strange series of circumstances you don't fully understand, suddenly your driver's license is useless, your girlfriend's picture's in your wallet, your dreams are on hold, and you are in a country thousands of miles away from home. Welcome to Vietnam. On this particular day, you would give anything not to be here, for you are going out on patrol. You've been on patrol before, but today is different, and that's why there's a knot in your gut and an icy fear in your heart. Today is different because the patrol leader has appointed you to be point man. In essence, you're the leader. Everyone else will fall in behind you. And as you move out to encounter the enemy, you realize that the survival of those seven men stepping cautiously behind you will depend upon just one thing, your ability to lead. Your judgment may determine whether they live or die. The responsibility hangs over your head like the suffocating humidity that hangs heavy in the air. Your senses have never been so alive, your adrenaline so surging. You can almost hear it rushing through your veins, and you know the enemy is near, maybe just hundreds of yards away. Intelligence reported heavy enemy activity in this area late last night, and your job is to confirm or deny that activity. For all you know, they're watching you right now. Perhaps they can see you, but you don't have a clue where they are. And as you gingerly make your way through the rainforest, you've got one eye out for for concealed wires in your path, and another scanning the trees for snipers. Entire patrols have been lost because the point man failed to anticipate an ambush. Men have been killed or horribly maimed, all because a point man lacked skill and wisdom. You never saw it coming. The violent shock and utter surprise of gunfire momentarily paralyzes you, despite your instant reaction training. Before you can respond, a bullet tears through your flesh and explodes the bone in your leg. A thousand thoughts instantly flood your mind. Am I going to die? What are those shot, where are those shots coming from? Is there more than one? Will I lose my leg? Where's the patrol leader? And one glance to your left tells you that the family of the patrol leader is now fatherless. In the chaos of attack and in spite of your wounds, the radio man makes his way to you. He knows, and you know, that you are the most experienced man. In panic situations like this, the book goes out the window, and like it or not, you are the leader. Now is the time your leadership will make the difference. What you say and do will determine whether your men live or die. As automatic weapons blaze around you, you must accurately assess the situation, determine the critical next steps, and formulate a flawless plan. It's leadership, pure and simple. He adds, let's make a critical change in the scenario. You're still in Vietnam on patrol in the same steamy rainforest, but something about the patrol is different. You're still the point man. But this time, you're not leading a group of men. You're leading your family. You look over your shoulder to see your wife and your children following behind 
behind and your little girl is trying to choke back the tears and your little boy is trying to act brave. Your wife is holding the baby and trying to keep him quiet. And on this patrol, you don't want to engage the enemy. You want to avoid him. What would you be feeling under such conditions? The survival of each member of your family and, it, and its survival as a whole would completely depend upon your ability to lead through the maze of possible ambushes, unseen booby traps, invisible snipers, and all the extraordinary hazards of combat. Would you be motivated? Would your senses and adrenaline be working overtime? Of course they would. You would know in your gut that the survival of your family was up to you. It's all on your shoulders because you are the leader. Gentlemen, this is no imaginary situation. It is reality. If you are a husband or father, then you are in a war. War has been declared upon the family, on your family and mine. And leading a family through the chaos of American culture is like leading a small patrol through enemy-occupied territory. And the casualties in this war were as real as the names etched on the Vietnam War Memorial. Men, you are in a war. And this world wants to bring down your marriage and wants to bring down your family and begins by the devil wants to bring down you. But you are called to be a point man. You're called to be on point with God. You're called to be on point with your spouse. And you're called to be on point with your children. And men, the problem in our culture isn't the lack of strong women. The problem in America is the lack of strong men who will stand up and say, I'm not going to be passive anymore, but I am going to be a leader. Not a, not a dictator, not an autocrat. She's not a doormat, but I'm going to be a loving servant leader and I'm going to lead my family. Amen? That's what God's called us to do and what he's called us to be. And as the worship team comes up front, I want to show you a gift that we have for you if you will merely respond today. So you see the four tables up here and we have for you a tool bag. All right, you like that? We have for you a tool bag, okay? Let me see if I can get this tool bag on again this morning. It says Mountain View Community Church, it has our church logo. And so, guys, this is a one time offer right now, okay? And it's free. Okay. So, in three minutes, I'm going to ask men to come up. There'll be a man at each managed table. There's a card in your bulletin. If you want a tool bag, we ask you just to fill out the card, name, phone number, and email. Uh, you can use a pencil in front of you. One of the ushers said this morning that men don't pick up bulletins. <laughs> so use your wife's bulletin. Steal one from some person next to you. Or use one of those welcome cards in the seat back in front of you. It's basically the same thing. Name, cell phone, and email. So, what's in this bag? We got a lot of good stuff. First, we got a 30-day devotional. I know summer's coming, and you know what the problem with summer is? Summer is awesome. It's my favorite time of the year. But men can miss church and miss God for two months. 30-day devotional. If you're like, where do I read? Well, it's right here for you. Okay? 30-day devotional. Maybe read one entry every other day, 60 days, two months. This is the best thing. I mean, ladies' wives, I mean, I know you, you don't have to pay me. I, mean, I know I'm helping you out here, right? I'm helping you out so much. Summer date pack, okay? Summer date pack. Put up by Family Life. Here's your summer date pack collection. Ten creative ways to deliver a love note, okay? I know that most of these men don't even know what a love note is. Ten creative ways to deliver a love note. Then we got in here all kinds of good stuff here. Twelve summer dates. Okay. Man, that's more than once a month, isn't it? Twelve summer dates. Twenty conversation starters. I know, wives, you have to start the conversation all the time. Men, if you don't know how to start a conversation, 
There's 20 start, starter conversations here. We have for you a gift card, $100 off to the next weekend to remember. Right there. It's like a two-night weekend, Christian weekend away. Then, kids for kids, we got double mint gum. 35 cent double mint gum right there. But the card says, a sticky conversation with your children. Share a piece of gum with your children and read Joshua 1, 7 to 8. As you read these verses and chew your gum, talk to your children about these points. Conversation starters. Then, of course, we've got the reminder of the next men's retreat in November, November 22nd to 23rd. So do you want to be a man or not? Do you want to be a godly man or not? And it's your choice. You can just, just be a man. Or you can try to be a godly man. You can try to be a point man. You're going to need help. You're going to need help of brothers and family members. And you're, I mean, we, we, all, we all mess up. We all need help. So if you turn in this car and get your, your tool bag, we'll email you and let you know in the next men's event. Every next event, men's event over the next three years, you will bring your tool bag with you, <laughs> okay? Do not throw your tool bag away, and we will discuss one of these three things, God, spouse, children, and that's the theme for the next three years. Bring your tool bag. When's the next men's event? Well, you're in luck. It's just 10 days away. It's Wednesday, June 26th. It's Guys Night at Guys. It's at my house, my backyard. You're invited to my house. Now, you have to RSVP within a week because next week we're going to let you know if it's still at my house, okay? Because we have 300 men coming. My wife has said, no, you do not trash my house, okay? We're not putting a porta john on the driveway, okay? She already told me that. No porta john on the driveway. But if we have less than 125 men, it's still at my house. If we get like 200, we'll have it here at the church. But you need to go to the website. You need to RSVP. It's going to be a great night. The bulletin, by the way, says guys grilling out hot dogs and serving everybody. Whatever. I'm not doing any of that. I'm just hosting this. Other men can grill the hot dogs, okay? <laughs> Let's all stand, everybody. And at this time, I want to pray. And when I'm done praying, men, I want you to fill out your card. I've got four men up here. I got Jay. I got Rob. I got Billy. I got Kurt over there. Hand them the card. They're going to give you a tool bag. They're going to put their hand on your shoulder and say a short prayer for you. And you're going to go home. And this summer, you're going to follow Christ. All right? Let's pray. So, Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for your goodness to us. And, Lord, I pray, help us as men, because we are so weak and feeble, to be point men for you. And help us, whatever commitment we're making now, today, to stick. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.